do think the geopolitical landscape is in a good place. I think the world is as uncertain and as troubled and as dangerous as it has been at any point in the last 40 years. As a former national security advisor, how important is the role of cyber playing in national security? I remember as national security advisor going down to GCHQ, the government communications headquarters in Cheltenham, and being shown on the screen there just how many cyber attacks there were on UK communications in the course of a few hours. And it was extraordinary and shocking to see just how much of this was going on. So the answer is that cyber it was important then, and it's even more important now, and the government's put a lot more resources into our cyber attack defenses. Uh, and this, of course, in the first place is about protecting government communications and military communications and other parts of the state. It's also about educating our businesses, our corporate sector, on how to protect their uh, confidential information. Because for them, information about new technology, new products, is extraordinarily valuable. So they need to be defending themselves as well, because there are certainly attacks going on all the time. So cyber is now a very, very big part of the national security scene for us and for other countries that um, around the world. In your opinion, what are the key traits to good leadership in business and politics? Yeah, there are some obvious points here. Um, you need to know your stuff uh, if you are going to lead uh, a group, um, an organization. You need to be pretty much well informed on everything that is, that is going on uh, that, uh, that you should be concerned with. You need to be ready to front up not just when there is good news, but most of all, when there is bad news to, to impart. And you need to, to show creativity and purpose and commitment uh, as much as anything to inspire the others um, in your team, uh, but also just to deliver your own best effort for what you're doing. But there's one other point that often doesn't get mentioned uh, in my view, that is, as important of all of those more obvious ones, which is you need to be a good listener. Because if you want your team to be engaged and committed and to welcome your leadership, they need to feel they're contributing. And all the best stuff I ever wrote or did uh, when I in my 40 year uh, government career was drawing on some brilliant work by people uh, in my team. And you have to acknowledge that. Uh, you have to have a live in an environment where you encourage feedback of all kinds, whether positive or negative, including for yourself. Mm. And you have to show your team that you are listening to them and taking their views into account. Because no matter how good you are, you can't know everything. Uh, and that's why you need people working with you who believe that if they speak up, that, that will be appreciated. As a civil servant of 40 years, how much has changed in politics in Whitehall since you began? Quite a lot has changed. I mean, politics has become uh, sharper edged. It's become less polite, less decorous. Um, it's become more adversarial, I think. Um, I think senior civil servants, um, the top positions around Whitehall, are now much now face much more public exposure than they used to. And you've seen with the current government in the last couple of years, uh, a number of uh, very senior civil servants who have been pushed to resign because they are out of sympathy or are accused of out of sympathy with the government's policies and intentions. And that didn't happen 40 years ago. But the single biggest change is in the media landscape. I was in the press office in the Foreign Office very early in my career, back in the late 1970s. I'm that old. And uh, in those days, there was ITV and BBC 
and the national newspapers, and that was it. Nowadays, you have a multiplicity of TV channels. You have these news channels, 24-hour news channels, competing with one another. Um, and you have social media out there, um, which also has massively changed the media landscape. Uh, so the pressure now from the media is much more intense than it used to be. The news cycle is 24 hours, seven days a week. And the pressure that comes from them for instant government reactions to almost any significant event around the world is really, really intense. And let me tell you, my experience is that having to re respond or react instantly to some event somewhere before you fully understood what is going on or its all its ramifications doesn't make for good policy. So it just makes things a lot more difficult. You've been in the room with some of the most important global conversations. What are the key factors needed for good negotiations? The obvious one is to know your own brief, to know what clearly what your objectives are, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, to have a clear negotiating plan so you don't put out your bottom line in the first few minutes, uh, to have an idea how you're going to get to where you intend to, to go. That clarity about your objectives is the single most important thing in all of that. But the other thing that you really, really need to know is you need to understand what your negotiating partner or negotiate opponent, however you want to put it, what their objectives and interests are, what they need, what they're looking for, try and have the best possible estimate of their bottom line, and also need to understand the politics or the economics or the security concerns that has pushed them towards wanting these things. In other words, what are the underlying reasons for their negotiating objectives? Because sometimes you can find ways through, which may not be exactly what they're looking for, which still meet their bottom line objectives there. So I say it's both about knowing what you want but also understanding as much as possible what the other side wants. Do you ever believe the geopolitical landscape is a good place currently and what can be done to make it better? I have to be frank here and say that I don't think the geopolitical landscape is in a good place. I think the world is as uncertain and as troubled and as dangerous as it has been at any point in the last 40 years. I think we now have war in Europe of a scale not seen since the Second World War. We have massive economic uncertainty around the world. We have the nightmare of climate change looming over us and so far international uh, response to that, the global response to that is inadequate. Uh, and I think we're also seeing the stalling of globalization. globalization is in some people's minds a bad thing, but the reality is it has brought unprecedented global prosperity over the last few decades. But the combination of all the factors that I've mentioned means that it is now, if not completely stalled, it is slowing down. We're gonna to have to get used to a world in which economies aren't growing at the rate they used to, in which you have people like Vladimir Putin invading neighbors, uh, with no reason other than increasing their own territory, not something we've seen since the Second World War, um, and where um, uncertainty prevails. That's not to mention problems like international terrorism. So I think it's quite a bleak landscape. I think it needs really good leadership around the world uh, to tackle these problems, these challenges. I'm not sure we've got that. And of course, I would say this as a former diplomat, but diplomacy is more important than ever. Do you think leaving the EU will have had a beneficial or a negative impact on the UK? I have my own views on whether Brexit was a good idea, but we're past that because we had a referendum and a majority of British people wanted to leave the EU. And I think if you believe in democracy, you have to accept that. I do have an issue though with the form of Brexit that the government has chosen. British people voted to leave the European Union, but they didn't specify in that vote 
what the form of that departure should be. And what we've done is we've chosen the hardest Brexit possible. We've chosen to leave the customs union. We've chosen to leave the single market. We've chosen to even uh, refuse to have any sort of formal structured security and foreign policy relationship with Europe. And that means the impact on British business, uh, on the British corporate sector, um, is going to be very serious and very bad. We've not seen the worst of it, anything like the worst of it yet. Uh, it means that we have to do the contacts we're having with Europe over Ukraine now, are sort of going underneath the surface. And they're happening, but it shows, I think, the craziness of choosing to refuse to have a formal structured relationship with Europe on foreign policy and national, international security matters. Um, I think it's going to damage our economy. And the risk is that ultimately, if we stay on the course that we're on, we're going to end up poorer than we should be. So if I were prime minister, I would be looking for a closer, of course, Brexit's a given, of course, I'm not saying we should rejoin the European Union, but we need a much closer relationship with Europe and I think we need to develop a series of agreements which bring us much closer to the single market.